that's good. Okay, so we have a pretty exciting topic ahead of us because, as most of you probably know, a lot of people talk about blockchain and gaming going hand in hand, and in fact, many of them are toting blockchain as one of the best applications for gaming. Actually, the, the other way around, so gaming is one of the best applications for blockchain. But before we dive deeper into the subject, I'd like to take a step back and perhaps take a look at what's going on in blockchain gaming from a more macro perspective. So yeah, take the lead, please, and tell us what's going on. Sure. I think you just fresh out of Hong Kong FinTech Week. There was a lot of excitement. So the first thing is that blockchain gaming and the tokens related to it have become a bit more mainstream. So for instance, uh, CF Benchmarks, which is basically a regular UK entity, together with Harvest, uh, Harvest Fund Management and Meta, Meta Labs have launched basically a GameFi index. And it now has a Bloomberg ticker that you can sort of uh, figure out. Um, I don't have the exact ticker name, but if you go to my Twitter, you'll find it, uh, which basically opens up the pathway uh, to be actually ultimately have game token related ETFs, for instance, as well, which is kind of, you know, everyone's talking about sort of Bitcoin spot ETFs that are sort of driving the market. Right. But actually, you can now see how other areas of tokens can expand into that. In that basket of tokens, you have tokens like Sand, uh, Mana, Axie Infinity, you know, and uh, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, basically other related gaming um, uh, tokens in there, and that basically is driving demand in the space as well. The other thing is is that broadly there's optimism in the market, uh, you know, because of Bitcoin spot ETFs. Right. Um, Tether has basically received an inflow of capital in that period of time. Um, which, you know, people don't put money into Tether to keep it in Tether. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they keep it into diversified into other ecosystems, so that's a net positive. And for those of you who have not been to Hong Kong FinTech Week, you, and, you know, if you look at ApeFest, if you look at what happened with Mocha Cruise, if you look at uh, sort of the Cool Cats events, all of the NFT projects have all basically seen a lot of excitement, uh, a lot of activity. 12,000 people descended into Hong Kong that were sort of Web3 mad, which is great. And of course, all the excitement that happened thereafter is a, is a net effect on that, especially in Asia. So, uh, so you know, we think that the whole space is growing, and Asia, I think, is leading the Web3 gaming charge. So it's quite positive. Okay, thank you. And Jeremy, before we went up, you mentioned that when we were speaking about this particular topic, you said that it's kind of hard to feel good about the market going up and because like we're almost sort of afraid that it's just like a temporary thing how do you feel about it now because we've certainly seen an uptick uh, throughout the past couple of months and yeah putting me on the spot there <laughs> um, i think there's two ways to look at it right which is the crypto segment has been fueled by speculation, especially in gaming, right? Where we haven't seen many great games coming out, DAUs tend to be very low. And so I'm always afraid when there's, you know, excitement, how long-term is it going to be? Right. That being said, I think we're finally getting to the, space, the moment in time where the work that all of the developers working in Web3 is finally paying off, right? For the right. past two years, I think a lot of people have been saying, where are the good games? When the good games come out, we'll see uh, you know, adoption going up. And to be honest, for the past two years, maybe like two to three games were, to me, interesting or good. Most of those games that were built in Web3 were not built by professional game developers. They were built by DGENs and really kind of targeting the DGEN crowd. And it's a valuable business strategy. But it's very niche, right? And coming from 15 years of free to play, I'm thinking big. I'm thinking millions of installs. I'm thinking millions of DAU. When I see you know, 50K DAU, 5K DAU, I'm like, who cares? Right. But now, when you see games like, I know Shrapnel just launched their token. Shrapnel is a kick ass FPS shooter, like built by professionals for FPS fans. And seeing all of those amazing games come out, and you know, uh, I'm thinking about Big Time, right? Big Time had a very successful token launch, but that's because Big Time is super fun. And certainly with that token launch, you've seen adoption going up, you've seen usage going up, and that even applies to Ronin, that finally is like onboarding more and more games, and you've seen Pixel just like go up in usage because they're serving as an adoption platform. So I'm excited about what's coming, but yes, to your point, I'm always, you know, I wouldn't say worried, but careful about not rushing to conclusion saying, this is it, this is the right. big boom. Because if you've been through enough cycles in crypto, you know that it's always like the arc of progress is not a linear line, right? That's going to up, downs, 
But over time, I do think we're going to be you know, a mass adopted uh, technology, uh, even though for most consumer, it's going to be seamless and transparent. Right. And speaking as a gamer myself, I've been gaming for as long as I can remember. I'm a AAA nerd, playing all the big titles. Chris, one thing that we can for sure say about us is that we definitely want everything right now. So we want new releases, we want new patches and everything. So my question to you as someone with very vast experience in game development is how do you guys leverage blockchain technology to make sure that this demand for you know, exciting releases is uh, met? Yeah, as a game developer, I think the uh, rewarding users and gamers by based on their, yes, their contribution will be considered as one of the key features in the blockchain to uh, improve the game industry for sure. But it's also evident that if the insufficient reward will fail to motivate users as well. So for, for now, the uh, macro and then when you see the market, the reward and the, um, the incentives by holding that NFTs or FTs are marginal. So it's still we need to create the market, market demand for sure first. So developing the, uh, the creating, building a Web3 world is I think it's very similar to creating a country, setting up the country. Right. So the, for example, the currency that they issue can be used to buy very compelling product or compelling content. It is value will increase or even like very stable. But it, the other way, it, there's nothing to do with, then it will it will decrease and approach to zero. So we might need to so like also we might need to think about the what how we can make that kind of consumption to make the market going and going. So, like uh, as a game developer, um, we also we um, sometimes we need to uh, think about how we can drive the uh, content. We keep keep uh, developing the content that users love to play, uh, love to enjoy from the consumer's perspective. If there is a sufficient uh, sufficient consumption occur, then it's the time when uh, the we uh, the the that attractive reward system for the uh, users, users of the users' contribution will finally work and it will definitely improve the game ecosystem by blockchain, I think. Okay, and um, one thing that uh, I mentioned AAA studios, right? But I, I do have a huge comment about these kind of huge game developers. One thing that they're not doing is, at least in my experience, they're not listening to the gamer, right? So very rarely you will see a huge uh, development studio that would actually take positive feedback and implement it into the game. And I feel like this is where Web3 gaming can actually shine. So yet, Animoca Brands, every Everyone has heard of the company. You guys are involved in multiple games. How do you go about creating this sort of community and then learning from the experiences that the players are actually sharing with, with the developers? So, I mean, Animoca Brands, outside the own games that we publish and develop, um, has invested in over 140 games in Web3. Uh, and it's actually very similar to when you think about how sort of mobile games developed in the early days. You know, it started sort of small and you have a mix of casual and you have mid-core and you have hardcore games. Right. And they all build that ecosystem because the one thing about gaming, when you speak about communities, is that the communities inside gaming themselves are also not the same, right? Like a gamer isn't the same gamer who's yeah. playing a first-person shooter or who's playing Candy Crush or who's basically playing sort of, um, you know, like a Clash Royale, right? And the same is basically true for Web3 games. So you have different categories of them. Um, but a few of the interesting lessons um, that I think is different about Web3 gaming is, uh, and, and so, uh, first of all, it's all inter interrelated. So meaning, because you're building on-chain, you share a network effect. So for instance, when Axie Infinity two years ago really, really blew up, uh, they innovated on a first game type, which basically was around essentially a rental model with a guild yeah. model, uh, and coin play to earn, you could say. And now they call it play and earn. But that's only one yeah. element of ownership. But that's a one category of type of gameplay that, that became enabled uh, because of that. But when Axie grew, the entire gaming industry in Game 5 grew as well. And that's because even though the assets at that moment in time weren't portable, the value was, was portable, meaning if I could, I could sell something for my Axie and I could buy another Game 5 project, for instance, I could trade value. And so the fact that one game really evolved, the rest of the ecosystem grew as well. 
Uh, and that's an effect that you see only in a cursory way in, uh, in, in, in uh, traditional gaming. For instance, if everyone's downloading, if everyone's using the App Store because they want to play Candy Crush, then other people might want to play other games. So you have that effect, but it's encapsulated within it. You can't transfer value. That's why the Web3 network effect is so powerful. So it means that if even just one game really, really becomes really successful in Web3, it will lift the entire economy up. And we're kind of seeing that effect today, right? If you see one token go up, other tokens right. start to follow as well. Um, so that's one, one, one interesting thing that's different. In other words, the encouragement is to say, when you build a Web3 game, you can't think of building in isolation. Yeah. In Web2, gaming is very much about sort of zero sum. I will win, you will lose, right? That's kind right. of thinking. But in Web3, if you win, actually you will help others win too. And this is the whole point about interoperability as well. Meaning that you want your assets ultimately to scale, to move to other games, to move to other ecosystems, and so forth, right? Um, the other thing that we've learned is that the Web2 and the Web3 gamer are very different because the Web3 gamer has a financial lens to it because they're more financially literate. Whereas the Web2 gamer, the majority of them, particularly in the West, they play for fun and they might actually have no financial literacy. Yeah. They may feel they know about money, but they don't know anything about it. So their lens is different. So that means that the game type and the meta game is different. So the meta game, what we experienced, starts with the token. It's not even just the NFT and the gameplay, the token itself is a meta game yeah. for the Web3 guy. Whereas for the Web2 guy, it's utility. Right? The token is something that I use um, inside the game, but I don't look at it as a game itself. I just look at the gameplay itself. Um, and when you look at Bartlett's player type, which is a very common sort of you know, psychological model for gaming, you've got the achievers, you've got the explorers, and you've right. got the socializers. And right now, the way that we can posit is that you know, the Web3 gamer is kind of like the achiever, which is like the 10%, right? the one that are driving it. But the social guys, like how many people play Minecraft because they love Minecraft? They play Minecraft because my friends play it, or this guy yeah. plays it, right? Um, and the same is happening in, in, um, in Web3. But the Web3 audience isn't that big. So how you drive the Web2 person to come in from a social aspect because of the Web3 gamer has to be about you know, how you share in the value. Right? And I think that's basically how what Axie Infinity and others demonstrated. So those are some of the findings. But again, as I say, maybe the biggest thing is when you build a successful Web3 game, Think of the network you're creating and the network you're sharing rather than just how my game is doing uh, because then you create really a Web2 model inside yeah. a Web3 frame. Yeah. And Jeremy, um, my question is, he mentioned, and, and it's obviously the case right now, a lot of the games are sort of intertwined with a, a certain to token that kind of brings an economic aspect to the game itself. But how do we prevent the game itself becoming s sort of pay to win? Because if you have access to, you know, an economic incentive, then you can kind of boost your, pay your way up the ladder, regardless of what the game is. And it, this could kind of ruin the gaming experience. So, Yeah, one, I don't think pay to win is a bad term, right? All of the most successful free to play games are de facto play to win. When you look at Clash Royale, uh, when you look at um, you know, any Forex game, Game of War, or State of Survival, or, or whatnot, there are always going to be players, you know, the persona, the competitor, the person who cares about winning, and if paying helps them win, they will. So I don't think pay to win is necessarily a, a bad thing. I want to go back to the topic of token value, right? Which is that the main criticism about Web3 Gaming has been that tokens tend to have a very short life cycle. They pump, they dump, and the game dies, right? But what people forget is that tokenomics applied to video games is a very new science, and it harkens back or recalls the early days of free-to-play. And, you know, Yat and I were there. Trust that the early free-to-play games, there was no product management. There was no live ops science. It was just like flying by the seat of our pants, and we've learned by failing by doing too many promotions, too many sales, or not enough, or not popping the right event at the right time. And it took a decade of experience to know exactly what the life cycle of a user is going to be, when to pop that message, when to offer a sale, and make sure that we're not just like pumping volume and revenue only to see it crash because we've inflated the soft currency or hot currency too much. And so tokenomics is going to be extremely hard to get right, even harder than uh, free-to-play, you're right. Suddenly you're inviting someone you at the table whose financial incentives are different than you. But I do believe we're starting to see less inflationary models. Like I do love the big time model because it's very tied to 
usage of the game, right? How do you generate the currency? It's by completing quests, there's a random factor, and then you use that currency, there's clear things. And I think that's where the intersection of free-to-play experience and Web3 is going to be as valuable, is taking all of the experience of sources and things, how do I generate the token, where do I burn it, how, how much, when, that is going to suddenly settle the balance between developers, between gamers. And, you know, there's one more model that, you know, not to be too positive about what you're doing, but I do love Rec League, right? Rec League's model is very, very smart, where the user creates a character by combining multiple NFTs they own, and out of every sale of that character in the free-to-play version of the game in the marketplace, the owner is going to have a royalty uh, generated. And that, I think, is probably the best, one of the best incentives I've seen is that holding plus some level of UGC combined, that's why you create a product that then is sold by the developer on your behalf for you to generate wealth. Thank you for the Rick plug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. you know, that aside, maybe I just want to add one thing also. Just look at the gaming industry itself. Um, last year, about $100 billion was spent in virtual goods, and right. most of them were skins. Right. Basically, they're fashion items inside games. Yeah. Right? I mean, for those of you who play PUBG or Fortnite or CSGO, Legends, CSGO like that, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the items that you buy don't give you an advantage in right. the game itself. They're purely decorative. And that comes down to gaming is a culture itself. And so the sink inside the game, right. when we talk about how you spend, comes to the culture. The culture is a community and how you sit in the status of that community. Oh, you achieved that skin. That's great. Um, and, you know, speaking of pay to win, uh, there's this term in gaming where you get paid to be carried. Right, there's whole websites where you basically recruit someone to help you right. carry because you're not able to buy the skin, so you want to have the status. So you hire someone to play either for you or to take you in the team. And that's, a, that's, an, actually, that's an actual job. Yeah. Um, so play, sort of pay to win is actually already inherent inside the gaming ecosystem. It's just that people have found other ways around it, um, which are not sort of, um, sort of part of the system. And now in Web3, it's integrated with it right. in a much more natural economic capitalist sense. Right. And tokenomics is obviously a huge part of designing the entire experience, right? Even the game itself. So Chris, how do we, how do we ensure that the value of the game itself and the experience that the game is bringing doesn't suffer when the token is going down? Because I feel like this is a huge concern for many up and coming developers that they create a great game, but maybe they don't do a great job in, in, in tokenomics, or even if they do a great job in tokenomics, the market conditions aren't currently okay, right? So the game itself kind of feels like it's suffering because the token is going down. And by the way, this is something that I want to discuss with all of you, but let's start with Chris on that. Yeah, it's a very complicated question. So yeah. like, <laughs> it, it's, I should cover everything, but let me start from the, um, there's a lot of, um, we should think about the fundamentals of the game first, because, right. you know, game, game, game fundamentally needs the specific rules, and they, uh, the gamers usually, um, they progress uh, through the interaction with the users or mobile, mobile phone, and, and, uh, and then to achieve the, some achievement. But many, uh, many previous crypto Web3 games, they yeah. try to like, utilize this, that rules and some achievement by financial gains. But, but it's, it's very, there was a lot of fluctuations and changes in their motivation due to the uh, fina like, uh, financial return changes. So it's, we should come back to the basic, I think, fundamental things. So uh, for, for example, we, um, like everyone, the, the users and then many real gamers in the world who has not into the Web3 games, yeah. they're looking into the games which are still entertaining them. So, uh, for example, Gumball, as a game company for the last seven years, we tried a lot of things in casual game world. So, like, um, when, like, everyone, you, you guys play the game a lot, like mobile game. When you click the back button, then it pops up, do you want to quit, right? Yeah. So, like, instead of gen this kind of generic and boring messages, we put, put that, we showed up the message that, are you handsome? Yeah. So we changed the message, yes and no. 
So like it was one of the, our effort that uh, want to, to entertain the users until the moment they exit the game. The Azure Wizard uh, it was so like incredible viral, and then some of a, a lot of people posted the message on their SNS and Facebook and and Instagram that I'm handsome, and someone said that I couldn't quit the game for three days because I'm handsome. Yeah. So uh, we should think about that kind of entertaining things to the users and uh, future uh, potential users. So we should start from how to entertain and entertain users, and then the blockchain and tokenomics will will add the value as a supplementary things, but not the complicated tokenomics will work, will do everything. So we need to think about how to entertain users first. And then if ma ma then it will make mass active users coming into the games, then it will make the token value. Yeah. So we need to think about long term. Yeah. OK. So kind of, kind of you know, go from building the foundations of the game, make it fun, make it entertaining to play and then the value of the token will come along and so i would add that uh, absolutely agree with everything that was said but i think one thing that's different about web3 is that the token in itself has become part of the gameplay right because in normal games the virtual currency right. inside the game is not part of the game because there's no market dynamic you can't create something out of it there's no staking there's no trading there's none of that stuff right i would argue for instance that skin trading in csgo is a game too yeah right but, you know, but it's enabled, of course, in a centralized way. And so the gameplay, the meta of CSGO became deeper because of the fact that you could trade skins, which you can't do in other games. And you know, one other game like EVE Online, because you have ownership, yeah. even though it's such an old game, is again because you have this parallel, this ownership, this percentile of people that, that do that. So maybe, um, so if you take a straw poll, I would argue that it's a, the beginning of a new type of gamer. You know, and how mo so when we went from PC gaming and console gaming to mobile gaming. Mobile gaming brought in a new gamer. It brought in a casual gamer, a gamer who was able to become a good gamer by just using a finger. Right? Right. It wasn't mobile, it was the fact that he was enabled. And that's how we went from half a billion users to three billion users. We, and then some of the three billion users like, oh, I like to play actually more difficult games, and then, or more, more immersive games, and then they started buying more consoles. Right. So the rise of mobile games had a direct correlation to the rise of hardcore games and to console games. And, but there's still 3 billion people, and there's about almost 5.5 billion people online, which means that almost half the world is still not playing games. Yeah. Right? And to me, the token element provides access to another type of gamer who's participating in, in a more passive way. Um, so maybe take a straw poll. How many people here actually have play games on a regular basis? All right, it's, I don't know, maybe... We have some gamers. Not half, it's maybe like 15%, 20%? Yeah. yeah. How many people here have purchased or owned gaming tokens? So it's a slightly higher number. Yeah. Right? My point is that I think those people who own tokens in the gaming world, but actually don't play the game in the, right. the skill base, but participate in the economy, join the Discord, do the stuff, are also part of the game. Yeah. And I think one of the findings for us was that the Web 2 and the, 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 the way that many Web 3 game studios in the past have been looking at it is that they've separated the two. Right? They said that the, the, the token holder is a, a user in the ecosystem, but is not part of the game. And our point is that actually you are still part of the game. You're part of the same community. You're a, a part of the member of right. the and You need to be incorporated. And one last thing that I want to discuss with you guys. And Jeremy, let's start with you. What do you think is like the biggest misconception of Web3 gaming that regular people have? I think actually the, con the misconception is probably on our side, more than on the gamer side, right? I do. I honestly believe that the narrative of Web3 gaming has been very poor. It's been very poorly communicated to consumers, right? Because the focus has been on like financial gains, and that's how you get the Simpsons episode of NFTs, right? Yeah. People saw it as like, this is great for us. I don't, I don't think it is, right? I don't think it is at all. Yes, more people know, but it's we're, we're the butt of the joke. It's like, who cares about this like $10,000 JPEG, right? When you focus on the financial gain, I do believe that you're removing or you're scaring away people, especially in the West. Like we know that you know, in the East, there's a higher tolerance for pay to win, for free to play. That's where free to play started. And adoption of Web3 gaming is going to be higher in those geos. But America, North America, Europe remain like one of the biggest markets. And culturally, we're just not set. We're a bit of like, I think, 
artisans, right? We see like, oh, entertainment should be pure, movie should be pure, there should be no, nobody can make money, right? We're very shy about money. So the narrative has been, has been very poor. The future of Web3 Gaming is going to not call it Web3 Gaming, or oh, it's on-chain gaming. Who cares? I think I said to you, who cares that this game is really built on AWS, or right. on Google services, right. right? Do you start your game by saying, oh, we've got the highest latency backend servers? No. You say the game is great, people love it. And so I think we're going to need to remove all of those narratives and focus on the added value to the user. You know, a company that's done it very well on mobile is Mythical Games, right? Today you can play NFL Rivals, you can play um, Nitro Nation. The adoption of NFTs amongst those players is probably some of the highest I've seen, right? Transactions are still low, but this is an entry and nowhere does it say you're trading an NFT, you're buying a crypto token, here's your wallet, do you have your secret words? No. And so the more we're going to move into those like safe and non-technology focused environment, the higher the adoption is. So, you know, I don't think the narrative has been borrowed like, you know, what is the misconception? No, people understand, right. right? And I think that's what scales them because we start talking about it first. Like, did you make token, like money on this airdrop? Did you farm yeah. it well? Yeah. Like, that's not, yeah. that's not exciting for, you know, regular people. Right. So I think that's going to change. I'm really excited to see more and more games, especially on mobile, that I think is like, that is the entryway, the golden entryway for Web3 gaming, because that's what people are. And ultimately, the, you know, the, the, the sin of Web3 gaming has been to think that we would create a new vertical. Like, right. uh, F Apple and Google, they're 30% fee. We're creating something brand new. No, the reality is we need to meet people where they are and where are they on their mobile phones. Chris, do you want to chip in oh, yeah, with yeah. the misconceptions? Sorry? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I, I miss it. <laughs> uh, sorry, I miss it. Miss the the qu question. Uh, so what are the biggest misconceptions that Web3 is facing? Yeah, like, um, I think the, uh, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions around the gaming because the uh, gaming should be fun, but the, you know, many, many crypto people, we, we also want to get some money, make some money, so that's why we jump into the game. So still, we need to come back to the basic, but at the same time, uh, we need to leverage the blockchain things to, uh, to uh, make some better gaming experiences in terms of user experience things. For example, um, the, 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 uh, there is a, so, so, the one of example I'm, I have been thinking is uh, we can uh, we can uh, inform the gamers in the later time that your in-game currency can be transferred to the uh, crypto token or it's, it can be owned or it's comparable to other content in the later time instead of in, in, um, uh, emphasizing that in the in the beginning because it will help the uh, early early users to have. Uh, avoid uh, the in in resistance to the blockchain games. At the same time, many loyalty users, lawyer users, they they will be able to have a time to digest and then uh, explore about the blockchains because they already into fall into the game. They are already in the later funnel of the game. So if they are already fall into the game, then if we can give them a little bit of the uh, incentives, uh, they have some time and rooms to try and think about that. So instead of like pushing the, uh, a lot of gamers about to the uh, connect to the wallet or like thinking about blockchain, we would rather uh, take some time and then let give, the, give some time to right. the users to have a lot of times to understand the game and enjoy game, fall into the game, and the later funner, we can ask them gradually, you have some like, your in-game currency, it values like $500 if you connect to the wallet later time. Then it will make users like feel more com comfortable and we can uh, clear up the misconception. I think it's one of the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe very quickly, my thought on this is that it has a lot to do with general education. Um, yeah. Financial literacy in the West is poorer than in the East, uh, which is to say that in the, in the West, people have a more negative view on capitalism. Crypto represents a kind of digital capitalism. Whereas in the East, we are very comfortable with capitalism. We like our real estate, we like to invest. We look at most things in a manner in which we think of as a return, even if it's 
made for our cultural right. lifestyle. You know, we buy this handbag or we buy this diamond because we think it has value, even though we will, might never sell it, right? So I think there's this thing. It's also the East that adopted free-to-play first. And, you know, the West actually heavily rejected it. They said, oh, this will pervert the gameplay. It's going to play to win. You know, five years later, free-to-play won, won yeah. because it was just a better business model. So I think, again, I think the whole sort of financification is, comes from a point of fear because they don't understand what it means. They don't understand that actually this is something that is already financified. All the value that the game companies are making, they're just not showing you how they're making it. And in Web3, you can now see it. And as a result, you can maybe share that value. And I think this is the messaging as well. You know, in gaming, we teach people all the time about new systems, right? I mean, think about every new game you play, you come out of it, you learn a new skill. My children can talk about Pokemon characters, and they can talk about sort of, you know, basically Call of Duty skills or whatever, right. uh, Apex Legend characters, you know, off the top of their head, right? Because they went through a tutorial, because they learned something new. And my point is that in gaming, we can do the same thing, but we can begin through gaming, through tokenized games, about financial literacy. Because once most of the world have a better idea about financial literacy, they'll understand that Web3 Gaming isn't a scam or isn't a get-rich scheme. That is just about sharing financial value in a fair and transparent manner. Right. And I think that's the narrative that's been missing because we've been not connecting the two in my mind. Yeah. Well, everyone, I think that about sums it up. So, yeah, thank you all for your time. Thank you for your time as well, guys.